Welcome back to the Five Verse Hangout, and today we're going to be talking about the newest Disney Star Wars show, The Acolyte. And just my thoughts, I'm going to mainly do a summary of the whole show for those that haven't seen it, so I'm probably going to put like a time of where I stopped talking here. Yeah. Yeah. But I'll also just go into just some of the, the just the, the pitfalls of the show and all that, so it should be some good fun. Before we get into the show itself, I want to talk about what I um, came to expect and from the show and what um, eventually the show became. And I was mainly expecting the show to be from the Sith, Sith's perspective. I did know there was going to be some sort of mystery aspect before even the trailer launched, but the trailer launched and that changed the perspective of what I thought the show would be. And then uh, the show release, and that again changed the perspective of what the show was going to be. So it went from a Sith's perspective show to, it went to like having multiple different mysteries, and we'll talk about that in the video, and my opinions on all that. So again, should be good fun. So we open with uh, a murder of Jedi Master Dara, and it is believed that our main, one of our main characters, Osha, is the one to do it. But it's revealed that she's framed, and instead it turns out to be her twin sister. So, um, Osha meets up with uh, Master Soul, played by Lee jung Jay, Yord, and Jackie. And um, they all are trying to prove that she did not kill the Jedi. Meanwhile, Mei is kind of in a plot to kill all four Jedi stationed on Brendok. Now, um, I thought... First, when the trailer dropped, that the mystery would be who's killing the Jedi. That is solved episode one, or I put up to episode one, and that turns out to be May. And then in episode two, um, we find out that she's trying to kill all these Jedi that were stationed on Brendok, which turns out to be the main mystery of what happened on Brendok. But we will again get into that a little bit later. And we meet um, her acquaintance, um, Kamir, who's played by Manny Jacinto who's kind of this goofy little potion maker, and she sneaks into the local Jedi temple to kill Master Torben, another one of the Jedi, obviously stationed on Brendok, and we learn that she is trying to kill all the Jedi on, that were stationed on Brendok without a weapon, but she keeps failing in doing so. She killed uh, Master Andaro with a knife and made Torben kill himself, so I don't really know the rules of that, but I'm sure they'll be explained later. After that, there's a bit of a scuffle between our main characters and May, and the two episodes end with our, um, us getting our first glance at uh, May's master, who, who appears to be a Sith with a red lightsaber. Episode 3 takes us out of the action for a flashback episode, and it turns out that we learn that May and Osha grew up together on Brendok um, with two mothers and a witch coven kind of protecting them on this planet. And, you know, they were uh, trained in what's called the Thread, which is just basically another version of the Force. Also, these witches are not at all associated with the Night Sisters, but the inspiration is definitely there. We see um, kind of, like, the witch's perception of the Thread and how it's... I mean, it, overall, it's pretty similar to Obi-Wan's spiel about how the uh, galaxy kind of just... or the galaxy is binded together by this one Thread, in this case. And then um, they're going. The twins are going to go through this ceremony called the Ascension, and then the Jedi, the four Jedi stationed on Brendok, show up, and there's a bit of tension, and they request to test the twins for their M counts, or to see if they're Jedi. M count is revealed later um, in a different flashback episode. Two of them. That's pretty crazy. So. Um, during the test, um, the twins are instructed to lie. May successfully does, but Osha doesn't get away with it, and Sol convinces her to complete and succeed the test, and she does. So the Jedi go to collect the twins, and violence ensues. Um, May starts a fire, seemingly, that burns down the entire um, fortress, seemingly. All the witches die accordingly, seemingly. And the Jedi are the saviors, seemingly. And, yeah. That's pretty much episode three. In episode four, our gang uh, goes to a planet called Kofar to try and find and warn 
the Wookiee Jedi Kanaka of May's impending attack without the blessing of Kiati Mundi, uh, who is in this series. I know, pretty crazy. Also, I mean, I guess that means he lied or something in episode three. But you know, episode three, Revenge of the Sith. That is. May and Kamir are also looking for Kilnaka, but to kill him without a weapon. Both parties uh, are getting close when May changes sides, switches teams, because Osha being alive changes everything. And Kamir gives this vaguely spooky little line of, he'll kill you, referring to her master, obviously. So, um, May arrives at Kilnaka's hut first, only to find him slashed by a lightsaber. And she figures out that her master is already there. The Jedi show up, announce their arrest warrant or something, and the uh, Sith, who we knew was there, I don't know why I'm blanking, the Sith we knew was there, floats down behind them to confront the Jedi. Pretty spooky. Episode 5, easily the best one. We open with... The Sith Master absolutely destroying all those red shirt Jedi that Soul, Jeki, and Yord took along with them. We see Soul and the Sith Master duel, and we see that the Sith Master has a Cortosis helmet, which, for those who don't know, Cortosis is a metal that can shut off lightsabers, which is pretty cool. And so we see that fight. They don't really get anywhere with that fight. Jeki and the Sith Master fight. Jeki bangs the helmet off of the Sith Master. When they're facing each other, the Sith Master shanks her, and when she falls out of the frame, we see that the Sith Master is actually Khmer. So, um, if you watch the show, you know that it was not really that big of a mystery. I kind of thought it was going to be that. There were some ideas that it was going to be one of the twins' mothers. Coral wasn't Coral. You know, Khmer, an interesting choice, but, you know, this wasn't supposed to be the main mystery of the show anyway, so, you know, hopefully that uh, fire on Brendok becomes very worth it in the end. So, after all that happens, Yord tries to come in and stop Khmer, so I can start saying Khmer now. He tries and stop Khmer, Khmer snaps his neck, pretty violent for Star Wars, also pretty cool for Star Wars, that's all I'm saying. And, um, after that, the, the episode ends in, uh disappointing fashion with a scene between Osha and May. I know, very hard. They are played by the same person, which must be, I mean, a difficult alone to do, but um, the scene just takes me out of it with the dialogues and the writing, and, um, you know, it's not a great kind of, there's like a little bit of a fight, because I don't know why, because May, last episode, like, Osha being alive changes everything. I'm going to turn myself into the Jedi now. She doesn't. Uh, May off-screen stabs Osha. Uh, I don't remember seeing that, but she, uh, Osha definitely has a stab wound. They switch places, effectively. May sneaks on. Not really sneaks on. Soul is well aware that she's on the ship, and he just doesn't sense it's her. And Osha um, is taken by Khmer to his little place. We'll see that in episode 6. But yeah, disappointing way to epi end the episode, but this is by far the best episode of the series. This is the episode where I really started to really start thinking about what my video about the show is going to be and how I have slowly just become more and more disappointed with the series. Um, it's pretty boring. We just see um, May on the ship with Sol waiting for the Jedi to send backup, and um, Sol still doesn't know about halfway through the episode, or halfway through that arc, probably three quarters of the way through the episode, he figures out who it is with the help of Basil, who I have yet to mention, but he's basically just this tracker dog who is kind of weird, but Sol then at the end of the episode teases for like the third time in a row, third episode in a row, the true backstory of what happened on Rendock, but we don't see that. The um, other, one of the other story arcs is um, Osha and Khmer on Khmer's little island, base planet thing. Kind of just talk about the quote-unquote semantics of the Jedi, as Khmer put it, which I thought was kind of funny. But a very just slow, um, interesting, 
it's, it's just slow. This whole episode is slow. And then the third little story, uh, I've yet to mention Vanessa Rowe. She's a pretty big character. Vanessa Rowe is in some of the um, High Republic books. I personally haven't read them. I want to. Just haven't gotten around to doing it. And we see her light whip, which was the only time we saw it in the, uh, in the whole show, even though it was teased in the trailer, which is just so frustrating that they're like, this looks like it's going to be a big part of the series. And she just whips a giant moth, which is kind of lame. But they find the dead Jedi, and they're like, let's bury them, and we need to find Soul. Soul jumps away, and yeah, teases what's going to happen on Brendock, but does not tell us. And the next episode is the second flashback, so we get it there. Episode 7 is just episode 3 from the Soul's perspective. When I said perspectives plural, I meant camera perspectives. They just kind of use a lot of clips from one other angle, which is kind of funny, but let's get down to the big bad backstory that caused Torben to kill himself, caused uh, Kilnaka to go into hiding, caused Soul to kind of just like, I don't know, completely change and caused Andara to just not really do anything, to be fair. So, it turns out the Jedi are there on Brendok to investigate a vergence in the Force, because apparently a hundred years earlier, Due to the hyperspace disaster, which is touched on in the High Republic books, um, Brendok was just charted as uninhabitable, but all of a sudden there's just a bunch of life. So, they're investigating if there's a virgin's there. And so, that just means that their intentions, they, ha they truly had no idea that the twins were there, or the witches were there, until Sol is doing his field work and he runs into um, one of the scenes we see earlier in episode 3 with the two twins. And from his point of view, uh, the witch mother that takes him back to the uh, fortress that they live in does seem a bit abusive and just mean overall. He breaks in and enters, break, bro, breaks in and enters the Jedi, the Jedi, the witch fortress, and we kind of see, um, just again from his perspective, the witches do not look good, which even though we know that that's not true, the witches take good care of their children, uh, from his perspective, this doesn't look good, and he sees they're preparing for the Ascension, which just looks kind of evil, so that's kind of bad. And he goes back and tells his Jedi uh, comrades about this. Andara is not really into, like, taking them away. Torben is like, or Night Sisters? <laughs> Night Witch. Night Sisters? Uh, no, not Night Sisters. And Kilnaka doesn't obviously seem to care. He's a Wookiee. But... Uh, we see the scene from episode 3 where they go talk to the witches and ask to test them. We see May's test and how Torben is involved in that a little bit, just drawing their blood. And then we see Osha's test again. We then see uh, the results of the test and Torben's like, oh my goodness. The, the virgins must be real. Th this, throughout this whole episode, we figure out that Torben's greatest desire is to go home to Coruscant. Just like, all right, man, that's fair, but like, why are you being such a brat? <laughs> you know, like, just do your work. You're a Jedi. That's pretty cool. So Torben wants to leave. So proving this is a virgin to the council will bring them home. Soul tries to stop him. Ends up kind of just joining him. A fight ensues. Soul turns out to be the one who kills uh, Mother Anasea. Coral just disappears into mist, and we never hear from her again. Seriously, like. It's just never talked about again. And uh, all the witches start possessing Kilnaka and they get into a fight. That's how Torben has all his scars when we see him in episode two. And uh, when Andara, you know, cleanses the mind of Kilnaka, all the, <laughs> all the witches just die again. It's just never touched on again. I'm like, what happened? This episode left us with so many answers and just didn't really do it didn't really do any of the, the questions. Uh, did I say, oh my gosh, I'm all over the place. I'm so sorry. But it gave us so many questions and gave us so little answers. Like, this is what killed Torben? Like, this is why he took the vow of silence and just didn't speak for 10 years and just he ended up killing himself? Like, really? Just a whiny brat that wants to go home? <laughs> but yeah, we see that uh, Master Soul chose to save Osha instead of May, 
and yeah, we just see how they plan to lie to the council of what happened at the end. So, this also, another episode where I was like, man, this is just not doing it for me. Um, yeah, this is the finale, and to me it doesn't really feel like a finale, and I don't know why that is. Um, it just feels like had they kind of halfway were setting up for uh, season two, and half I were just like, we can end it here if we need to, but let me just tell you, if you don't know. Everybody's going back to Brendock, and uh, that's pretty much Master Soul's fault. Master Soul has, like, Osha, or May, disguised as Osha, uh, on, like, a, a, a surgeon's bed, and then she, like, escapes somehow from him, which, to me, was just dumb. Just use the force. Stop her. And she escapes. There's a chase through, um, a, like, a planetary ring system, but it's like, I think it's a moon that has rings. Anyway, not sure if that's really how layers of rings work. I feel like the rings of Peridia, that chase scene, was a lot cooler than this one. Um, we also see that Vernestra is dealing with political problems with the Jedi, and how the Senate is trying to search the Jedi, and, it, and she does not want that, so. Um, but she also is going back to Brandok. Premier and uh, Osha. Osha sees this like vision of a soul dying on Brendock, presumably, so that's why she takes him there. And um, when they leave, we get probably the coolest part of the show, to be honest, which is a bit depressing. Four seconds, and we see Darth Plagueis in live action, which is just awesome. <laughs> like, it's just so... It's awesome. I honestly can't critique that at all. Um... I'll talk about my theory of why he's here <laughs> after this, but uh, I really liked that. That was cool. But um, we get to Brendok, Sol and Kamir fight again, and Osha and May fight again. The Osha and May fight is just lame compared to the Sol and Kamir fight, just because there's only so much you can do when it's played by one person. There's only so many CGI, so many body doubles, so many whatever you can do to make a fight look good. And that's just why the lightsaber fight is just better. Um, it's a pretty even fight throughout the whole thing. Then um, Sol gets disarmed, and he tells um, May the truth, and Osha kind of eavesdrops on this, that they're actually one consciousness split into two different people. So they're the same person, just two people. Kind of. It's confusing, to be fair. Uh, Osha gets hella pissed, steals his Master Soul's lightsaber, chokes him to death, like, force chokes him, which is kind of cool, um, and bleeds the crystal red. So, we get to see that live action, and when she turns on the lightsaber, it's blue, but then it slowly transitions to red. Also, pretty cool, I do have to admit. Uh, the twins and Khmer escape um, when the Jedi get there, and we find out that Khmer was Renestra's old... Jedi Padawan, kind of implied by the whip scars on his back that we saw in episode 6. But uh, after that, um, Osha and May meet up at their little meeting spot under the tree, and um, Kamir finds them. The Jedi are looking for them, they don't have a lot of time, and Osha makes a deal that she will train with him if she, if uh, Kamir lets May go. And to save Everybody here, I guess. Um, Kamir wipes uh, May's memory of any memory of Osha or uh, Kamir. So, that's pretty interesting. The Jedi find May. She has no idea why they're trying to arrest her. And she has a little chat with uh, Vanestra, and she's like, this is so unfortunate. Vanestra comes clean to some of the senators, but... She's still making excuses, like, and lies of how a uh, soul died. She says he killed himself, but he didn't, obviously. And, yeah, we end the episode with Kamir and Osha quite literally looking off into the sunset. And a Yoda tease at the end, when Vanestra comes into Yoda's meditation room, and he, she's just like, Master, we have to talk. So, yeah, that's... How the show ends. 
first, my theory on Plagueis. So, the Sith famously have a rule of two, and with Kinera training an acolyte, as he calls his um, apprentices, crazy. He said the name of the show. That would just, that's three. But I think it's four, because I think at this point, Darth Plagueis is still an apprentice to his master, Darth Tenebris, and he's trying to overthrow him. And that's why Kamir would help him then overthrow uh, Tenebris. So then Kamir wants help with this, so he's getting the uh, Acolyte to help him and Plagueis overthrow Tenebris. So then eventually he can be um, Plagueis' only apprentice. Obviously we know that Kamir does not end up being Plagueis' only apprentice, and then Chief Palpatine becomes Plagueis' apprentice, who later becomes... Darth Sidious and takes over the galaxy and yeah so that's my theory it's not much it's just you know it just lines up with the timeline more accurately than if it was just Plagueis from my understanding so yeah I will talk about the good stuff because it's not all bad and there are some stuff that I genuinely like starting off with that Plagueis that was pretty cool and I feel like they showed him in a way that is very accurate to what uh, I understand Plagueis to look like. Um, I also like the acting from Li Zhang Zhe and Manny Jacinto, who play Sol and Khmer. I think that is just some better acting on the show, and we'll get into some of the other stuff. Um, I like the choreography in the show. The show is incredible, especially when the people are not using lightsabers, unless it's Osha and Mei fighting without lightsabers, not great. When it's, like, Mei fighting the Jedi with no lightsabers, it's awesome. The lightsaber choreography is awesome. And just, it's just, the choreography is truly good in the show. And anyone, I think, who doesn't like the choreography or say, you know, the choreography is bad. No, it's the best Disney live-action lightsaber choreography, and you're just trying to hate on the show for extra reasons, and you need to get into that later. I also like the music overall. The music doesn't stand out to me, um, except for the end credit song of episode 7, I believe, which is a pop song called Rule of Two. I haven't listened to it since episode 7, and uh, I don't really vibe with it, but, I mean, overall, it's a, it's a fine song, I guess, but like I said, music in all Star Wars projects, in my opinion, has always just been solid, and this one just doesn't stand out. But it is good, because that's the one thing Star Wars always does right now, for music. And uh, the costumes overall look pretty great. The Jedi especially, and I think Kamir's outfit is also awesome. There's this one outfit that Osha is wearing um, in episode 6 and 8, where it's, I think, a, it's like a crop top, long sleeve with holes in the shoulders and a hood, something like that. I'm pretty sure you could go buy that shirt at Target. Like, I'm sure I've seen somebody wearing that shirt in real life, so it's just not too new. But everything else other than that, in my opinion, pretty solid costume design. I also really like the ship design in the show. I think, uh, especially Kamir, uh, we see Kamir ship in episode 8, which is like this two-piloting style ship. I, th I really like that. The Jedi ship um, is like retro 60s kind of look to it. I like that. And overall, the uh, overall the ships look good, decent, fine, whatever. Now, on to the more critical things. This section might feel like more of a rant because I just have a list of things that I want to talk about or that I just didn't like about the series. And overall, I think it's a longer list of things that are not good compared to good. Um, first of all, the, the writing and dialogue just did not do it to me. Specifically, Ocean May, again, the actress, Amandala still, uh, God, I cannot say her name, but Amandala, she, I mean, she's good, she was in the holograms, pretty sure, right? And, um, it just hasn't just done it for me at all, especially when they are talking to each other. I think Soul and Kamira are honestly just the best um, line or line delivery and acting overall. Just, it's some just, it, 
I, I don't know. I don't really have anything else to say other than that. I have a list right next to me, so that's why you might see me looking down. After that, it's the use of the volume. This show, and use of the volume and use of the budget. This show had a budget of $180 million, which is, I believe, the second the Star Wars show. Andor had $250 million. But the difference between Andor and the Acolyte is I can see that Andor definitely had a higher budget. I can tell visibly it the way things are shot. Um, it's, the, it's just a better show, but from where the budget comes from, the way things are shot, the way just the CGI looks when there is CGI, Andor's a lot of practical stuff. And I feel like the Acolyte, I don't know where $180 million went. They used the volume, I'm pretty sure, to a larger extent than at least Andor did. And just recently, the volume just hasn't been doing it for me. Like, Kenobi, Mando Season 3, and this show, and some of Ahsoka, to be honest, the volume just doesn't look great. And I continue to wonder why they have it for main shooting. I get it if it's like a reshoot and you can't get the location, but if you can, just shoot on location. That's just arguably better. Um, so that's my uh, critique on the budget. Um, the mystery of the show. Uh, I didn't know it was going to be a mystery. Then the trailer dropped. I thought the mystery was, who's killing these Jedi? And then when the show was released, oh, there's two mysteries now. I mean, like, who, what happened on Brendock, and who is the Sith Master? Sith Master 1, kind of predictable. What happened on Brendock? We basically got an answer in Episode 3, just there's a few more puzzle pieces. Like, it just doesn't do it for me. Like, it doesn't make sense that you took the Barash vow after whatever happened here. Sure, like, Torben is, like, 100%. Torben and Soul definitely take 100% of the blame for what happened on Brendock. No doubt about it. But... It just doesn't, like, I thought it was going to be more like the Jedi killed all the witches in cold blood, you know, but Sol really killed Mother NSA in like a self-defense way because she was starting to turn into mist and he was like, oh, I, I don't know what the, what's going on. Boom. Self-defense, if you ask me. Torben wasn't deflecting any of the witches' arrows because he can't with the lightsaber. He was just disarming the witches. Um, Sol didn't kill Coral. He was playing defensively until he heard there was a fire. Also, I thought the Jedi would be responsible for the fire. They were not. And just overall, if I was one of the Jedi there, I would not have taken the Barash vow. I also probably wouldn't have lied to the council, because I'm just, I'm just... I'd be a better Jedi than that. <laughs> so, interesting. Um, the flashback episodes. Uh, flashbacks are really hard to do. Uh, especially when Disney and Star Wars are doing them. Uh, Andor did the flashbacks, I think, really well. And that's because they were almost like cryptic enough where we still could infer some things, but they answered questions. Whereas Book of Boba Fett and the Acolyte just seem a little unnecessary. Especially Book of Boba Fett, but that's for a different video. The Acolyte, I think, should have just had one episode that was flashbacks from the full perspective. Did not need episode three flashbacks at all. It took me, it took me, it took a lot of people out of what was gearing up to be a pretty decent story. And what continued to be a decent story. But it just cut in between that and I kind of forgot where we were going when it went from episode two to four. And I just don't think that's just the smartest way to do it. I think, like I said, one episode or Little hints of flashback. That's what made Andor so great. Didn't have an entire episode of flashbacks. Because you know why? It knew, the showrunners knew that the more interesting thing was what was going on right now. They were telling Andor's story of how he joined the Rebellion. And sure, his flashbacks were a part of that. But in the end of the day, the main storyline plays a bigger part. And that's what I think this show should have done as well. I'm sorry, just looking at my list here. It's kind of hard to read with these sunglasses. Uh, there's some plot holes. I mean, like, Soul says that he saw May. See, he saw May with the face marking. She has a little face marking on her tattoo, or on her forehead, a little tattoo on her forehead. And he was like, that wasn't there when I saw them earlier. 
Dog, you weren't close enough to see their foreheads, and when you were, their hair was covering it. Like, how did you know that she had a face marker? Like, that doesn't make any sense. What are you talking about? Stop lying, bro. Like, God, I don't know why. That one, that one, like, my mom kept repeatedly saying that when we were watching it. I'm like, yeah, fair point. I'm going to talk about that, because that's a really fair point. When did you see her forehead? I'm going to cut here, because this is becoming a little ridiculous. Just another critique. I th I've, I've gone into this in this video already, but this Torben does not make sense to me. The, the, he was, he took the Barash vow for 10 years, but the flashback on Brendok was 16 years. So there were six years where he went from a Padawan to a Jedi Knight and then took the Barash vow then. Went through the effort of t taking, of taking the tests and going through the trials to become a Jedi Knight just to take the Barash vow. Like, doesn't make sense to me because I just don't think that what he did was that bad. And I'm just, I mean, yeah, he was selfish. He did not act like a Jedi. 10 years for the Barash Vow? Maybe one year. Maybe one year of the Barash Vow to find yourself. But 10 years is outrageous to me. It's kind of funny. Uh, also, just some final ones to wrap up this section, because it is one of the longest sections of the video, is uh, Coral. What happened? It was like, I feel like it's almost implied that she is playing a bigger part in this whole thing, but she's not. She just disappears and we don't get that answered. What? What? Why? <laughs> Why? This just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, the witches, again, did they die? Did Master Andara kill them? If so, she seems pretty nonchalant about it. Did they just pass out? I don't know. I really couldn't tell you because the show didn't tell us. And, and with the virgins, still not entirely sure what it means that the two twins are two different people, but one person, but two different people. Um, they were manipulated by Mother Anasea using the Force, which is different than Anakin, I might add. Anakin was created just outright by the Force. You know? Force is, force is Son. And he's Force Jesus right here. So the, uh, the Force manipulated midichlorians, where here it seemed like Mother Anasea manipulated midichlorians. But, again, we honestly don't know. We have still don't know how they were really created. Assumably, with the Virgins, I'm still holding out that they're actually clones. But... I don't know. That's probably not how it is. But wrapping up the bad stuff, we're probably we're gonna talk about some of the unnecessary hate that this show got before it even came out. There's a very big difference between um, saying you hate a show and actually hating a show. Saying you hate a show is making a bunch of different criticisms and just hate, genuine, pretty much hate, um, in some cases, actual genuine hate uh, against the creators and some of the actors and stuff, before the show even comes out, which is unbelievable, versus actually not liking the show. Hating is a strong word, but actually not liking the show. Watching the show all the way through, um, criticizing it in a way where you give your full, like, you can give your opinion, and um, also accept that even if you don't like it, you can see and respect why other people might find it enjoyable. I saw a comment that I was like, if you like the show, you're not a real Star Wars fan. That is so stupid to me. It pisses me off. If someone likes something that you don't, just don't talk to them about it. Or have a friendly debate and maybe just you know, wrap it up. But that's just not how we as humans can solve conflicts like this. I, just, I mean, it's kind of gotten away from the acolyte, but just treat people with respect, I guess. Wait until the show actually comes out. It was unbelievable. The trailer has got to be one of the most disliked things on YouTube now. It's outrageous. There were some funny comments, arguably, on the trailer, but that was just... <laughs> most of the funny ones I like were just referencing Dude. The other ones were just... Well, just wait till the show comes out. You can't say anything about it unless you're an actual like film critic or show critic who saw the show before it came out. So to me, that was just so unfortunate, and the show was pretty much stuck before it even started. But uh, I personally just just liked the show after it came out. I just didn't vibe with it. Didn't, it just didn't stick. Where like, and that's this category versus just hating the show before it comes out. But yeah, said. So, a lot of the subject, and yeah, that's it. I'm not going to say anything else.
This show ultimately was pitched as a Sith story, from what I can tell. Well, ultimately it was pitched as a uh, Asajj Ventress story. Asajj Ventress story, for those who don't know. Um, but and you can clearly tell, which is my sisters, you can clearly tell that that is kind of where the show was headed, but it was changed. And mm, that's not what we got. We did not get a lot of Sith at all. Just the last couple of episodes. And sure, we got Plagueis, but you can't just say that that was your Sith show. Like, we're the show with Plagueis, we're the Sith show. No, you're the murder mystery show. That's real mystery isn't the murder mystery. So, um, yeah. Again, just another shortcoming of the show is just the budget. I don't quite understand. Uh, Google recently, and from what I can tell, um, a show that is comparable in quality almost is Kenobi. There are some aspects of it I like, which include a lot of the um, like lightsaber fights. I think are great in Kenobi, uh, especially that last one it was a little goofy at some points, but overall it was enjoyable. Then there was some stuff where I was like, what? Like we used the volume, just some. Just story beats in general, like Obi-Wan hiding Leia in his cloak when they're leaving the Fortress Inquisitorius, or Leia outrunning bodyguards by just going under a branch, but um, that show had a budget of $90 million. That's half of what the Acolyte had. So you'd think the Acolyte would be twice as good. It's on par with Kenobi, which is disappointing. I just don't see where $180 million went. And I know... I think some were some stuff was filmed in location. There were some scenes where it was like, yeah, in the forest, that's forest. But there are just some scenes where it's like on Brendock, especially. It's like that just looks like the drawing. Are we sure we're running through a forest here? But at the end of the day, I mean, that's not. I mean, the worst thing that could happen, I guess. Like the volume can be good. Mando season one and two are very big examples of that. Both of those shows heavily used the volume, and they were great. But, yeah, I'm just, this has been a kind of a long video, so I'm just gonna wrap up and just leave it at this. I'm gonna say it. I don't think this is the worst Star Wars show. Yeah, kind of crazy, right? But, I mean, when you have things like Resistance... Okay, taking animation out of it, I still don't think this is the worst live-action Star Wars show. Definitely, certainly isn't the best. I'm not saying it's the best. I'm not saying it's even good. I'm saying it's alright. Would I watch it again? Probably not. I would say, like I said, on par with Kenobi. I still think Book of Boba Fett is by far the worst live-action Star Wars show. And I think I will do a video talking about that. But, what... At the end of the day, what this show is and was, is just a, honestly, I'm going to say it, kind of a disappointment. A disappointment. Disappointing show, just a, a really interesting premise that failed to succeed in execution. And that, I feel like, is the fate of a lot of Star Wars shows recently. I think um, Kenobi had a very interesting idea. Didn't work. Book of Boba Fett, the most promising idea of any of these disappointing Star Wars shows, and it did not, it, it, it disappointed me, like, so, yeah, I, and like I said, I just don't, like, it's not the worst, and I, I <laughs> don't know why I'm having a hard time explaining this, but I am, and it's just, it's because I don't know why did this show got... I'm still just so confused why the show got hit before it even started. And that's a very interesting thing that's unique to this show. It got hit before it started. <laughs> I can't think of another Star Wars show that got hit before it even aired. So, yeah, that's my thoughts on it. And that was the Acolyte. So that was my thoughts on the Acolyte. Kind of... Uh, Structured in an interesting way, but kind of a little bit rantish near the end. I know that's just my video style and how I get and yeah, so 
If you like the video, like the video. Subscribe if you like Star Wars, I guess. And if you don't like other stuff, you know, Reckon, some other stuff. I, I don't just like Star Wars, but as you can see from some of the stuff behind me, it's a big part of this channel. So yeah, subscribe to the 5% out. Later, guys.